commercial supersonic flight has a unique problem. The first commercial supersonic flight happened with Concorde in 1976, and the last was in 2003. Why have we been unable to replicate this success for over 20 years? We have much more advanced technology, aviation plays with oceans of money every year, and the Concorde has almost a cult fandom. Many companies have tried, but none have succeeded, and it might be time to ask, is commercial supersonic doomed to fail? To answer this question, the obvious starting point is taking a quick look at what made Concorde work and what made it fail. Concorde was a joint effort by the British Aircraft Corporation and the French company Aerospatiale. Concorde was one of only two commercial supersonic planes ever, the other being the Tupolev Tu-144, which only operated commercially for less than a year. Concorde made 500 times the number of commercial flights as the Tu-144, totaling about 50,000 flights over 27 years of operation. Concorde is an incredible plane, flying at 1,354 miles per hour, or Mach 2.04. The heating due to air friction at this speed was so immense that the entire plane expanded about six inches in flight. Well, this is something I didn't expect. We're at 53,000 feet. It's minus 56 degrees outside, and the window is really hot to the touch. You can't almost keep your hand on it. It could fly from London to New York in three hours, and even offered flights around the world. These journeys offered 20 days of travel, 30 hours of flight time, and covered over 28,000 miles. An obvious issue with this speed is the sonic boom. People claim that Concorde was cracking windows and it generated many noise complaints. Concorde was restricted to only going supersonic over the ocean. Flight paths were initially limited, like London to Bahrain and Paris to Rio de Janeiro. The routes to New York and D.C. were added, and the Concorde did have other routes that were temporarily available. Concorde was also very expensive. The plane was seen as the peak of luxury travel, with multi-course meals, champagne, wine, caviar, and lobster. CNT says, quote, It was rare to have a flight without at least one famous passenger. The expensive tickets weren't just to compensate for this high-end treatment, though. The flight itself also had to be paid for. And Concorde was a gas guzzler, using 6,771 gallons of fuel per hour and carrying around 100 passengers. For comparison, a Boeing 747 uses about 4,000 gallons per hour and carries about 400 passengers. Maintenance costs were also extremely high, as it's more costly per plane to maintain a smaller fleet. Early in Concorde operation, a ticket from London to Washington would cost about $2,800 in today's money. By 1996, a round trip across the Atlantic would cost $12,500. Concorde's development also greatly exceeded all monetary expectations. It was initially expected to cost $130 million, but ultimately cost $2.8 billion. If you type 2.8 billion into an Apple calculator, you need to turn the phone sideways to fit the whole number. And yeah, Concorde went 21 times over budget. The French and British governments wrote off this cost, but it was an alarming precedent of surprisingly high costs. It's often said that Concorde didn't turn a profit, but this is only partially true. The British government sold the fleet to British Airways in 1984 for just 16.5 million euros, Due to the government write-offs, it did initially turn a profit, but this profit would slowly dry up in the years before its retirement. Concorde also had trouble with environmentalists. The gas-guzzling, boom-sounding emission machine, of course, caught a lot of criticism. The National Air and Space Museum describes the shift in public perception as, What was once synonymous with supersonic and luxury soon became synonymous with noise and exhaust emissions. The final gut punch to Concorde was the crash in July of 2000, where, upon takeoff, a piece of debris from another plane on the runway punctured one of Concorde's tires, which then broke apart and struck a fuel tank on the wing. The fuel tank then ruptured, 
and spewed fuel and fire. The plane could not abort the takeoff and crashed into a hotel, killing 113 people. This accident further hurt public relations. You can find articles from 2000 asking questions like, Is it all over for Concord? Should Concords have still been flying? And is Concord worth keeping? Concord was grounded until November 7, 2001, which was unfortunate timing as it was two months past 9-11 and air travel was at a low. Concord was retired in October of 2003, with its downfall due to mounting costs and declining trust and profit. Its major issues were incredible costs, noise, flight routes, terrible emissions, public relations, and just bad timing. But it's been almost 50 years since its first commercial flight. Why haven't we been able to overcome these problems since? I'm going to highlight two commercial supersonic companies that tried and failed to revive supersonic transport. The first is Arion, founded in 2004 by industry pros and backed by a billionaire. Arion worked for 10 years on a smaller twin-engine supersonic passenger plane, but switched to work with Airbus on the AS2 passenger business jet in 2014. Airbus then dropped out in 2017 and Lockheed Martin came in, and the plane was changed to a three-engine configuration and was designed to reduce the sonic boom. GE also joined to develop the engines. However, in 2019, Lockheed dropped out as well, and Boeing came in. This was unfortunate timing for Arion, as Boeing joined just before their second major 737 MAX crash. Boeing was also experiencing troubles with development of their other airliners, as usual, and then COVID hit and caused the cancellation of many plane orders. Boeing could no longer justify their financial commitment to Arion. Arion struggled to find another deal and were considering going public, but ultimately shut down in May of 2021. Forbes described their difficulties as, Arion was widely considered to have the best chance of success and to be the farthest along of several groups developing new supersonic passenger aircraft. Yet it had, after 17 years of trying, failed to build even one actual airplane. Like Concorde, Arion struggled with costs, but unfortunately they didn't have the opportunity to have the government write off billions of dollars for them. The lack of a consistent source of funding, the struggle to develop a supersonic engine, and a hefty serving of bad luck all contributed to Arion's end. The other failed commercial supersonic company I'll talk about is Exosonic. Founded in 2019, they raised a few million dollars through investors and Air Force grants and began to develop the supersonic airliner Horizon and a larger UAV called Revenant. Exosonic promised to reduce the sonic boom that creates those restrictive regulations. Unlike Arion, Exosonic did actually get a plane in the air. They flew the EX-3M Trident in April of 2024, so quite recently, as shown in this video. The Trident is a quarter-scale model of their larger Revenant UAS, and it's like it's like five feet long. This is a this is a toy. Yeah, Exosonic shut down seven months later in November of 2024, far from producing a functioning supersonic airliner. I know I just made fun of them, but Exosonic CEO Norris Tai did give a good interview that was insightful into Exosonic struggles. Business Insider says, quote, Tai said with full capital, meaning billions more dollars, it could take 10 to 15 years to build, certify, and deliver a new supersonic plane. And that's if the supply chain, potential design setbacks, and other factors don't add abnormal expenses. Tai also said engine manufacturers aren't investing in supersonic flight, hindering one of the industry's most vital components, power. Engine manufacturers don't want to commit to designing and developing an expensive new engine that will be used on maybe a few hundred planes in the best possible case. Exosonic, like Concorde and Arion, struggled with costs. TechCrunch describes their situation as, it sounds like the company was ultimately unable to bridge what's often referred to in defense tech as the valley of death, the period between R&D and commercialization. Forbes sums it up this way. Building an aircraft large enough for multiple adults to fly in great comfort and to do so while not causing disturbing sonic booms on the ground below while traveling in excess of Mach 1, the speed of sound, is a significant technical challenge. Yet that technical challenge is dwarfed by the almost incalculable economic challenge. So now I ask the question again, is commercial supersonic doomed to fail? 
there are differing opinions. If you go back and look it up, starting from the 90s, proponents of supersonic flight say it's always 10 years away, says Brian Foley, a business aviation industry consultant. Why 10 years? Probably because it's a number that's not too distant, but far enough that when the time comes, no one will remember all the promises you made and failed to deliver on. Some still believe, though, it's taken longer than we would have hoped, but there will absolutely be supersonic flight says Vic Kachoria, the CEO of Spike Aviation. We think supersonic will offer a lot of value and will be very useful. Think of the original iPhone. In those early days, it made huge leaps every year. That's where we are with supersonic, says Blake Scholl, CEO of Boom. Tech advances in S-curves. Products go through periods of slow development, then rapid improvement, then level off again to incremental gains. It's important to notice who these two proponents are, though. Both are CEOs of two of the surviving commercial supersonic companies, so they obviously have some skin in the game. But can they back up their beliefs? Let's look at one last company, Boom Supersonic. Right now, Boom Supersonic has answers to most of the questions that took down many of the previous contenders. They're fairly high profile and seem to have a solid financial backing from investors. They also have a real working demonstrator plane and one that's big enough that they can't just toss it in their trunk and drive off at the end of the day. They have also been testing it, slowly approaching the speed of sound. They just announced their plan to live stream its first attempt at supersonic flight on January 28, 2025 at 8.45 a.m. Central Time. So I'll post a link to that in the comments below. Technology is also developing that will supposedly reduce the sound of the sonic boom on the ground to be as loud as a car door slamming. The Lockheed Martin X-59 is designed to stop shockwaves from coalescing, instead spreading out into the air and creating a, quote, quiet thump instead of a loud boom. If this technology can be utilized by boom, they might no longer be restricted by regulations due to sonic booms. As for emissions, boom claims that they'll use sustainable aviation fuels, and boom is also developing their own symphony engine that will go into their overture, their supersonic transport, that will carry around 70 passengers. They seem to have it all thought out, but is it still unfeasible? In 2022, the assembly said, Boom estimates that it will take between $6 billion and $8 billion to bring Overture to market. Funding that the company says will come from equity fundraising, airline prepayments, supplier commitments, and other sources. The company has announced some $270 million in funding so far, which includes investments from interested airlines and the military. Boom will also have to contend with the cost of operating the airline. Sustainable aviation fuels can be many, many times more expensive than regular fuels. Dan Rutherford, director of the Aviation and Marine Programs for the International Council on Clean Transportation, expressed skepticism to the assembly. Here are a few of his quotes. The economics of supersonics has never been good. If you impose either an overland flight ban or require the use of SAFs, the market basically completely disappears. The claim that Overture is going to fly for the first time in 2026 and that they're going to do it without an engine under development is pretty wild. It's a supersonic glider at this point. CNN cited the harshest criticism for Boom that I could find. The fact that no major engine manufacturer, such as GE, Rolls-Royce, or Pratt & Whitney, is working with Boom is another reason for concern, according to Richard Abulafia, managing director at the aviation consultancy firm Aerodynamic Advisory. Quote, I regard Boom as a somewhat amusing experiment in seeing how much money people would invest in fun-looking drawings and models. Everything about it, from the lack of a serious engine to that weird and inexplicable massive redesign a few years ago, speaks to a case of seriously overfunded wishful thinking. Boom expects the Overture to first fly in 2026 and to enter service in 2029. I am very suspicious of this and expect this to be delayed at the very least. Looking at this past history of failures, along with experts' opinions of all the hurdles that are yet to be addressed, I can't be confident in Boom's success. Don't get me wrong, I want nothing more than to see supersonic transports come back, and nothing would make me happier than being wrong about this. But I don't think Boom will live up to their promises. I will excitedly watch their live stream of their first supersonic flight, but it's important to remember that this is still just a demonstrator. And the functional overture goal is next year in 2026.
And even if it does succeed, I don't think they'll be able to fulfill all of their promises. It will be very difficult to turn a profit while only using sustainable aviation fuels. And they claim they plan to make tickets more accessible to the general public. I don't think both of these things can be true unless drastic changes happen in the coming years. And the goals that they have set also seem very ambitious. And I'll be very surprised if they have a functioning prototype by 2026. So is commercial supersonic doomed to fail? In my opinion, it certainly seems like it for right now. There are a lot of problems that are yet to be addressed. It requires constant and adequate financial backing to fund costly design and development, profitability to cover high operating costs, and advanced technology to reduce emissions and sonic booms. The price tag on designing, developing, and maintaining a fleet of supersonic planes is the key factor that is stopping the revival of supersonic transport. It is very difficult to turn a profit in this space. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you disagree with my conclusion, feel free to let me know. Um, it makes me sad, but yeah, I'm not sure Boom will be the one to take Concord's place, but I sincerely, I sincerely hope I am wrong. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Bye.